So it's really important to create and publish content because people buy from companies that they know, like, and trust. If they don't know you, like you, and trust you, they can't buy from you. They won't buy from you. And people won't spend money uh, getting to know, like, and trust you. They want to essentially just read stuff for free that allows them to kind of understand who you are. You're listening to the Content 10X Podcast, where it's all about content repurposing. I'm Amy Woods, and I'm here to help you maximize your content and find smart ways to get your message in front of more of the right people, whilst also saving time. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome to the Content 10X Podcast. I'm your host, Amy Woods, founder of Content 10X. And in this week's episode, it's all about the importance of building an audience, creating content, how to turn your audience into leads and grow your business. I have a fantastic guest on the show. My guest is none other than Daniel Priestley. Daniel is the founder of Dent Global and Score App. He is a four times best-selling author. He is a leading authority in scaling businesses. His reputation and extensive experience with his own companies have seen him advising for Inc. 500 leaders and unicorn entrepreneurs, as well as appearing regularly in the media. Starting with nothing, Daniel has built valuable and scalable businesses in Australia, the UK, the US and Canada and Singapore. Daniel's mission is to develop entrepreneurs who stand out, scale up and make a positive impact in the world. I spoke to Daniel in this week's episode about the importance of creating content and why it's so important for business. Also about overcoming apprehensions about becoming a personal brand focused business. We discuss what Score App is and how it helps you to acquire high quality leads, deliver targeted content and create new content. And of course, we talk about the importance of repurposing content. Let's jump in. Daniel, welcome to the Content 10X podcast. It's so good to be on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Now, Daniel, I've read Oversubscribed and Key Person of Influence, both excellent books. So thank you so much for them. And it's funny because I read them both maybe about three years into running Content 10X. But yet what we essentially do is we help businesses to become oversubscribed and we help people to become a key person of influence through our content repurposing services. And so our overarching philosophy and approach is just completely aligned with yours in those books. So it's so great to speak with you today. Now, in your book, Key Person of Influence, you detail the five elements of influence, two of which I am super interested in talking about today, which are publish and profile. So I'd love for you to explain a little bit about these and why they're so important to becoming an authority in your industry. Now, starting with publish, why is it important to create and publish content? So it's really important to create and publish content because people buy from companies that they know, like, and trust. If they don't know you, like you, and trust you, they can't buy from you, they won't buy from you, and people won't spend money uh, getting to know, like, and trust you. They want to essentially just read stuff for free that allows them to kind of understand who you are. Uh, So there's some research from a, a guy called Professor Robin Dunbar. And he said that there's this rule called the 7114 rule. It's actually on blending together a couple of bits of his research with some Google research. Google did research called um, Zero Moments of Truth. Robin Dunbar did uh, research on how people bond and how people form friendships. Um, And it really came down to time that we spend with each other, uh, interactions, positive interactions, and different locations or platforms that we interact so um, I, I cherry picked the best bits. And in the book, oversubscribed, I said 7-11 for seven hours, 11 interactions, four platforms. Um, and basically, the human brain doesn't really know whether it's having a digital or an analog interaction. So the reason that we uh, you know, feel sad when Do- David Bowie passes away is not because we knew David Bowie personally, it's because we had connected with David Bowie on video, on media, on audio. Um, we had read articles about David Bowie. So we felt like we knew David Bowie, but in actual fact, it was just published content that we'd gotten, <laughs> that we'd gotten to know him through. Um, so this is, this is the same phenomenon that when people 
spend seven hours, 11 interactions on four platforms with your published content, they get to know you, like you, trust you, and you occupy a part of their brain, which is reserved for friends and acquaintances. And that's, that's the first part of having a successful business, having an audience. Yeah, it's so funny you should talk about that because I also have said a lot, I've done a lot of content on 7-11-4. I've even got a keynote that's called 7-11-4 and it's about, it's about exactly what you said, the zero moment of truth and creating content across all those different platforms and formats and locations to get people to, to know, like, and trust you. So, you know, completely relate with everything that you said. Um, in terms of the other element of influence, so, you know, we're talking obviously publish, that's why it's so important to publish content. Could you explain a bit about the profile side of it as well? So we live in an incredibly noisy world. Um, where there's so much content, there's so many videos, articles, blogs, podcasts, tweets, posts, uh, endlessly coming at us. We have to have a very quick way of deciding whether I'm going to invest time and energy uh, on this. So when you have a profile, <clears throat> essentially you are positioned as an authority or you have a, you're, you're positioned as someone worth listening to and it allows people to make a shortcut of saying I'll put more weight on what that person has to say. So if we think about a profile, it's being able to be seen from a distance. Um, uh, you know, it's 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 having a um, uh, an ability for your marketplace to be able to pick up on what you're saying. So we're looking for uh, the ability to you know elevate your brand and elevate your profile to to more people. Um, and very simple maths: if only a small number of people buy from you. The larger your audience, the larger your profile, the more sales you'll make. Uh, and it's unfortunate, but you can't really escape that. That, you know, if, if two or three percent of people buy from you, if you've got a hundred people who know who you are, you've got two or three customers. If you've got a thousand people who know who you are, you've got 20 or 30 customers, and so on and so forth. So you need to be able to elevate to, to those bigger, um, those bigger areas. We talk a lot about how to do that, and we talk about this idea of salt. Salt is uh, social media awards accreditations, uh, live events, and traditional or third-party platforms. And essentially, we want to build our platform, build our profile across all of those, um, uh, those, those uh, strategies. We want to have a strategy for building profile on all of those. Uh, but it's so important to be positioned, you know, as, as that high-profile person these days because, uh, you know, people just don't listen unless they think you've, unless they think you'll, you, you might have a phenomenal thing to say, but if people don't see you as a expert or as an authority, uh, or they don't see your profile is, is that other people are listening to you, they just don't particularly pick up on it. Yeah, I completely agree. What have you personally found has been um, the, a good content method or good types of content that have helped you? Um, because obviously you've got a very, you know, big personal brand and have achieved what you are teaching other people to achieve. What's worked for you? The number one thing is the book. So when I wrote a book, that gave me a profile because I suddenly magically became an author. Uh, and magically radio stations want to have you on when you're an author and TV stations want to have you on when you're an author and podcasters want to invite you as a guest when you're an author. Even if people have not read the book, they still know you wrote it. So therefore, uh, it's a um, you know it's it's an authority piece, and it kind of separates you from others. So having the book has been really powerful. Um, the other thing too is when you go through the process of writing a book, you really have to think about what you want to say, and you have to think about your content. You've got to typically do some research. You've got to see what other people are saying on the topic. Uh, you've got to find some interesting statistics, anecdotes, stories, analogies. So by the time you've finished that project, you've got lots of great uh, refined content that you can use. You can then break that up, as you know, repurpose it across different platforms. So uh, I've just been writing a book at the moment called Scorecard Marketing. And as I was writing the book, whenever a really good you know, paragraph would come out, I'd cut and paste that straight onto LinkedIn and say, I'm writing a book. Here's a paragraph from the book. And I'd get a conversation going with that. And people would engage with that. And then I would kind of make it a few changes and put it back in the book. And um, so it's not like it's, it, you know, today a book is a central document for the whole idea. 
but that can be broken up into smaller ideas across lots of different platforms. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I mean, there's a year, two, three years worth of content out of a book, isn't there? So you put all that hard work into to have the book and then you have a content strategy off the back of the book as well. So um, it's all about like maximizing the time on the content. In terms of content for personal brands versus businesses. So, you know, you have Daniel Priestley and then you've got Dent and you've got Score App as well. So how do you see the content being different for that business versus personal content? So the most top of funnel or wide reaching brand is the personal brand. That's the one that the most people are going to engage with. Uh, and there's some great numbers around this. Like Richard Branson has got 12 and a half million followers. Virgin's only got a quarter of a million followers. Elon Musk has got 95 million followers and Tesla's got 10 million followers. Um, and even Tim Cook has 14 million followers and Apple has 7 million followers. Uh, and you would think Apple, you know, being the biggest brand in the world with a lot of fans uh, would be bigger than Tim Cook, but Tim Cook's double the, uh, the following uh, of Apple. So it turns out that humans absolutely love other humans. We want to connect with other humans. We don't really think about the world in brands and logos. Uh, we really think about the world in people. Um, and we also judge businesses by the people who run them and own them. So, for example, uh, if a hair salon down the road, if I happen to know that that hair salon, hair salon was owned by a celebrity um, you know, that, that I admire, uh, I'd be more likely to go there even if I don't see them, if, even if they're not there personally. I just kind of like the idea of going to their hair salon. So uh, these are, you know, these are very normal things, especially the big wide reaching social media profiles. Once people want to buy from a brand, they want to check it out. They want to have a look at what other people are saying. They might want to deep dive and, and have a look at some of the products or services or the case studies or testimonials. So now they, they kind of move into um, going and having a bit of a, a look at the, um, uh, at the business brand. But it tends to be, you know, confirming what they already know or doing a bit of research into some of the details uh, that they're doing there. But by and large, most people don't necessarily like engaging with faceless brands. What do you think about, I guess, an apprehension that, that you must hear quite often where people are hesitant about going too heavy on their personal brand in themselves because they're worried that, you know, they're going to, that's going to become too much of an attachment to the business. So should the day come when they move on from the business, want to sell it, or that they're a leader in an organization and they're just thinking that they, they, that it can't be all about them. What, what do you kind of, I suppose, say to that apprehension that people often have? So it's funny, there's a motorbike analogy that I like, which is that uh, when you turn a motorbike, uh, you think in your brain that you would turn the handlebars the way you want to go, uh, and that would turn the bike. But if you actually did that in real life, you would flip the bike over and it would crash. The way that you actually turn the motorbike is that you lean into the corner and you actually push the handlebars the opposite direction that you want to go to make sure that the wheel doesn't turn in. Um, and it's counterintuitive. It's, it's a little bit of a weird dynamic that, that uh, seems like the opposite. So what's interesting when it comes to personal brands is the companies that sell the easiest are the ones that have been built by a personal brand. Richard Branson sells companies all the time. He's forever selling virgin, virgin businesses. Um, uh, Jeff Bezos only owns 10% of Amazon now and 90% has been bought by other people. Uh, and Elon Musk has multiple companies now. He's got half a dozen different companies that he heads up and his personal brand attracts phenomenal talent who run those businesses uh, and it attracts customers sometimes. Sometimes it repels customers more recently. <laughs> um, but essentially what happens is once you've got a personal brand, you attract team and talent uh, who can run the business and you keep them for longer. Uh, you attract customers who buy from the business uh, and you attract an ultimately an acquirer who wants to buy the business. You transfer all of that brand equity into the business and even still, I mean, look, this week I'm actually selling a company. I'm, I'm selling one of my businesses for an amazing amount of money. It's a, a successful deal. Um, and part of the deal is that I'm going to be an ambassador who does something for that business two or three times a year um, where they've signed an agreement, an additional agreement in, on top of purchasing the company 
they want to sign an additional agreement that three times a year they can pay me, not not for, out of the goodness of my heart, they can pay me to do a, a special um, event with that business, um, you know, to, to maintain some uh, continuity. So, you know, double whammy, that's fabulous. Yeah, that was my next question, actually. I was, I was going to say to you that I guess when it comes to the sale of per, heavy personal branded businesses, I suppose quite often that's just featured into the sale agreement, isn't it? Where, you know, more often than not, it'll be that the owner will stay within the business for a certain tie-in period before moving on. And I guess that can be the period where a new personal brand can arise and transition through that process as well. So that's another yeah. another common feature, isn't it? Well, when someone buys a business, they typically, there's three main things that they're looking at, which is, does this business have a team, a really great team? Normally, people who acquire businesses want a team of about 40 people plus um, because a 40-person team tends to have passed the point where it's dependent on any one particular person. One, you know, one or two people can leave and they don't leave a gaping hole in the business. Um, so about 40 people tends to be a minimum size for a solid acquisition, a cash deal, for example. Um, the second thing people want is that they want to know that that business actually owns assets. Uh, so it's very unlikely that people want to buy a business where it's brokering somebody else's uh, assets. So if you're a reseller of a product, uh, that's a very low value business compared to if you own the, the product. Um, and then finally, they buy recurring revenue or predictable revenue streams. Um, so when you think about what role does a personal brand play, uh, in the first instance, it attracts that team and holds the team in place. In the second instance, it develops that asset set and that you're building out assets um, and that you're creating assets that run the business. Um, in the third instance, um, people trust you enough to, to enter into a recurring revenue contract. So therefore, you know, they, they um, you know, the business takes on that life of its own. Uh, you know, one of the businesses that I'm growing at the moment, we're a valuable business, we're, um, you know, we're, we're, we're a fast growth business, we're growing at about 10% a month, we raise money at an astronomically wonderful valuation. Uh, and... I just have finished writing a book uh, for that business. And if that business is ever sold, the business owns the rights to that book and the business can publish that book and distribute that book. And that is an asset of the business. So that intellectual property, that sales generation tool, that marketing tool, even though I wrote it, that will actually be owned by the business. So that will be seen by any acquirer as a business asset where they part of the box and dice is that they have a book that explains the concept and, and helps to uh, market the business in many different ways. So it's a body of content that actually the, the rights of that book will be passed on with that business. Mm, that's really, yeah, the, the book is so intrinsically tied to the business. It, that completely makes sense. So yeah, it's really interesting. Hey, just a little break from this week's episode to let you know about becoming a content 10x insider. If you want more content repurposing tips and advice, then why not join hundreds of business owners, marketers, and content creators who get them delivered straight to their inbox once a week by subscribing to the content 10x newsletter. As well as tips and advice, you get industry updates, inspiring stories, exclusive content offers, and more. You can subscribe at content10x.com forward slash newsletter, and there's a link in the show notes too okay back to this week's episode can we jump over and talk about him um, about score app so i know that's a you know a big focus of yours at the moment a big i guess first question you know what what is score app so i'll give you a bit of a story um i wrote a book called key person of influence and i wrote it in it came out in 2010 and i had that hey, there it is yay <laughs> um i had Thousands of people reading the book in year one and two and three, but we didn't know who they were. They were just buying the book and we knew the sales were happening, but didn't really know who was buying the book. Or sometimes when we'd have an event, we'd give out copies of the book, but we didn't know much about whether anyone had actually read it or all of those sorts of things. So in 2014, came up with an idea to put a scorecard on the book. And the scorecard was basically, it says, to get the most out of this book, start by answering 40 questions, which will highlight whether you're a key, you know, where you need to improve as a key person of influence. So people go online, they enter in the details and then they enter 
name, email, etc. And then it asks them things like, have you written a blog in the last month? Have you won any awards? Do you give talks? Um, uh, do you have a product available that features your personal brand? So it's like kind of all of these questions relating to being a key person of influence. And then at the end, it says, here's your overall score. You scored 61%. And here's, you, here's how you scored for the five Ps. You're, you're four out of 10 for pitching, eight out of 10 for publishing, six out of 10 for products. So it goes through and gives them that on a PDF. Anyway, this became super successful. 90,000 90, people filled in the, the KPI scorecard um, and well over 10 million worth of sales came in uh, off, straight off the back of um, the, the scorecard. So it was, a, it was a home run because people could self-diagnose um, they could self-diagnose whether they needed to buy something. They could answer a set of questions. If they agreed with how they answered the questions, which they answered, the, they answered them, uh, then they could agree with, actually, I want to improve those uh, things. So it was a hugely valuable uh, tool for us, and it kind of carried us from 2014 through to 2020, um, especially when I had a very young family. I had three kids under five at one point. Um, I've got a three-year-old, a four-year-old, and a seven-year-old now. So, um, you know, very, very young family. And it was great because it was a way of generating sales that didn't really require my yeah. time. Um, mm -hmm. So that was that was cool. So uh, lots of businesses started asking, can I get one of these as well? Would you help me build one? We did do some testing in 2019 to see whether it worked across industries. We tried it on about 10 different industries from DJing to working with corporates uh, mental health, physical health, construction industry, right? So we went and did like a whole bunch of these scorecards uh, custom built. And we realized this works across the board. Anytime people need to diagnose something in order to buy, or they need to kind of fact find about themselves to see whether they would get value from something, uh, then that online scorecard is a 24-7 a lead generator. So what we did is we built the platform score app in 2020 and launched it. Uh, and over the last two years, 2,000 companies have signed up. Uh, and uh, we're now seeing scorecards globally and across industries. And people spend a couple of hours setting up their scorecard and it just generates leads month in, month out. And it's, it's a really powerful um, strategy. Very simple idea. It's a landing page. The landing page tells you to take a quiz. The quiz has points associated to all of the answers. And at the end, it gives you a results page that tells you what you should and shouldn't do with custom content um, on the on the back end there. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. You know, you, you gave me a, a quick demo and, um, you know, I'm, I'm not just saying it because I'm talking to you now, but I, I really liked it. And I'm definitely going to be speaking to our team about it because it's a it's kind of a win-win situation in terms of that your your audience, your potential customer gets to find out a bit more about themselves, gets something from it and gets targeted valuable content that helps them. But like you said, of course, you actually get that miss, you know, that missing data that most of us don't get, which is that information that we can then mm. sell to them, but in a targeted way, in a, in a customized targeted way, not going with service A when it should be product B or whatever. So it's yeah. um it's, it's really, really useful. And, and it's hard to get people's data and information these days. People aren't as willing to get that free ebook or whatever those old lead magnet methods that, you know, people are still teaching these days, just offer up a lead magnet and you'll get your ideal clients giving you your, your email addresses, but it just doesn't work like that anymore, does it? So no, <laughs> no. and it ties in with you know, the importance of creating content, because as we started this conversation, we talked about how important it is to have oh, yeah. valuable content. So the scorecard is the, the scorecard is really the bridge between valuable content and your business. So, you know, this podcast, for example, um, most of the time, people who listen to a podcast are completely anonymous. You might have 10,000 listeners, you'll see a number on a screen that says this podcast was downloaded 10,000 times. But what you don't have is any information about who those 10,000 people are specifically. So if you sign off a podcast with um, next action step is to take this scorecard, take the key person of influence scorecard, see if you're a key person of influence, suddenly people go, oh, that sounds like a good action step. They fill it in. And now you've got, let's say only um, out of 10,000, let's say only 500 people filled it in. But what that would mean is that your business now knows exactly who the 500 people who are most engaged in the podcast are, 
And uh, those are the ones to talk to. And you can talk to them about the things that they said on their scorecard. Yeah, exactly. And, and you, you just get a lot of useful information as well as the personal data to be able to follow up with individuals and, and contact them and serve them content. Do you find that you also, it, it helps you with future content plans as well, because you're seeing these patterns in terms of what your audience is saying and perhaps looking at the ones that went on to become clients and what were their answers and what new content would should, should we create? Well, let's create content based on what they're telling I'll, us. I'll give you two, ex- uh, two specific examples. We did a little scorecard the other day called the performance marketing scorecard. And one of the questions was, um, do you know your allowable cost per lead? I was absolutely shocked that 72% said no. And then there was another scorecard question on there that says, do you have someone on your team responsible for setting appointments for your sales uh, for your sales team, like sales appointment setter role? And I forget the exact number, but it was like 80% said no. And um, so that's two pieces of content. So I've got a piece of content that says, I recently found that 72% of experienced entrepreneurs don't know, an, haven't calculated an allowable cost per lead and don't know it off the top of their head. Here's why that's important. And secondly, I've discovered that um, 80% of my uh, clients do not have a sales appointment setter. And here's how I use a sales appointment setter. And here's how I think you should as well. And suddenly we've got an entire conversation going based upon two standout pieces of data that I know will interest my audience. Yeah, exactly. And you can create so much with that. Like you said, you can go straight to social media, you can create a blog post and a podcast and a chapter of the next book and so on so yeah it's a, it's a it's a data gathering tool that also is a bridge to your content and is also a, a content generator as well isn't it so um it's all those things and more so it's fantastic i'm definitely going to be checking it out <laughs> um as one um as one uh, final question daniel um what would you say is one of the biggest mistakes that you see people make when they are creating content to try and grow and scale their business uh, there's a lot of mistakes that people make i'll start by saying that there's a very narrow path of what you should do and there's a very wide path of things you shouldn't do. Um, so you do not want to be busy but not productive. You do not want to be caught on a content treadmill where you know, you're know you creating endless TikTok videos and no one cares and no one's buying and you're literally spending your most valuable resource you know, entertaining 19-year-olds uh, and it's like, well, what's the point in that? So let me let me broaden the question a little bit to begin with. There was a magical period of time uh, from 2007 to 2015 where any activity that you did online kind of got immediate engagement and it, to a degree, got engagement from the right people. Like it sort of just all just worked. And you would call that the explosive uptick of the S-curve. You know, there's adoption curve and it's called an S-curve. It starts off slow and then it explodes and then it hits the top and it narrows out and it kind of matures. And what most people remember is 2007 to 2015, the explosive uptick of that S-curve and how valuable that was as a business tool that you could do anything and it would kind of produce business. It was pretty cool. It was, a, it was a great magical time. Um, as that has matured, you need to have a content strategy that is really educating people as to why they need to buy from the business, giving them case studies and stories and examples. Um, and it's, it's signal, not noise. It says the same thing regularly. Uh, you know, for example, we, we go along to a Metallica concert because we want to hear Metallica music. We don't want to hear Metallica have a go at Coldplay. We don't want to hear Metallica have a have a have a chance at being Muse or the Backstreet Boys. We want to see Metallica be Metallica. And even though we've heard that song before, we like hearing that song from Metallica. So each individual needs to pick the topics that they are going to be an authority for, and they need to pretty much stay in their lane ninety percent of the time, and just give people signal, not noise. Mm. Give people yeah. quality content, not random uh, quantity of content. Um, and 
one of the big things, one of the big things is people spend so much time on creating new stuff, new content, and not amplifying what's working. So um, I, I had a friend of mine in Singapore who was head of marketing for um, Amer American Express, and they have a one to four rule or a one to five rule, but it's basically that for every one hour they spend on content, they spend four hours boosting it. Um, for every one dollar they spend on creation of content, they spend four dollars to five dollars on boosting that content. So, for example, you might spend 50 hours writing a book. Well, you need to be spending 200 hours promoting that book and you might spend 5,000 pounds on the creation of the book where you need to spend 25,000 pounds on the marketing and promotion of that book. Um, so I'm seeing all these people, they're constantly every day coming up with some random new idea and, and they're jumping on everything that moves without a plan and, and without stopping and thinking about the narrow set of things that people want to hear from them and just doubling down on that and really moving that out into the marketplace in a, in a bigger way, uh, you know. Yeah, I completely agree with you. It's like the shotgun approach when the sniper approach is more appropriate, basically, isn't it? Yeah, and just, yeah. just recognising that it's matured. Social media yeah. has yeah. matured. Yeah. Um, we, don't, we no longer live in the time of uh, random anything works. It's got to be done with caution because otherwise it'll suck a whole bunch of time and money and deliver absolutely nothing. Um, and that's why people should work with a company like yours because you do it all day, every day, you see what's working. Uh, and that's where, you know, that's where the market's moved to now. Yeah. And I mean, I love what you said that you were a buddy of yours works in one of the like larger corporate organizations and, and, you know, they have a rule that for every hour spent on content, there's four hours of maximization, repurposing, boosting, um, because I just think that needs to be embedded into all of the content mm. departments within these larger organizations. And, you know, we find that often it, it is, it, it just isn't there at all. There is just that hamster wheel approach of new, oh. new, 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 new. <laughs> um, have, you, um, have you seen on TV faulty towers, right? You know, sometimes you're flicking through the channels and there's faulty towers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you must think that there must be hundreds of episodes of faulty towers. There's 12. There's only 12 episodes. That's it. So John Cleese, he wrote 12 episodes of faulty towers he produced them two seasons. That's it. That's all. But oh my goodness, he is phenomenal at licensing those to every TV station that has a dead dead spot that they need to fill. And he has licensed those twelve episodes for millions and millions and millions, years year after year after year after year. And he's not created a third edition or fourth edition. He's just really maximized the value of those twelve episodes of Faulty Towers. So. We need to have a bit more of a John Cleese approach, create some good quality content and really get it out there. Yeah, I absolutely love that. I've never heard that analogy before yet. It did blow my mind when someone once told me there is only 12 episodes of Faulty Towers. I think they said, how many do you think they did? I don't know, 50, 100, 60, 100 yeah, yeah. <laughs> like 12. Yeah, we need a, the, a John Cleese Faulty Towers approach to our content. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Well, Daniel, thank you so much for coming on um, the show. It's been such a, a fantastic conversation. So thank you so much. Um, My pleasure. In terms of any action that you would like our listeners to take, anywhere you want them to connect with you or anything like that, what yeah, would you like so, to do? So here's, here's fun. Take the Key Person of Influence scorecard. So if you do a Google search, Key Person of Influence scorecard, uh, it'll come up and you can see exactly what, what happens and what, how it works. Um, and then if you like the idea of creating something like that, check out scoreapp.com, uh, S-C-O-R-E-A-P-P.com, scoreapp, uh, and you can build your own scorecard. And uh, normally it takes, um, you know, it takes an hour or two to set up a scorecard and then it, it lasts for years. Uh, it can sit there generating leads month in, month out. So, um, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd encourage people to test it, see if it works, do a free trial, no contracts or anything like that. So, uh, if it works great and if it doesn't you just switch it off brilliant okay well thanks so much i'll put the links to both of those in our show notes so uh yeah thank you so much it's been such a great conversation thanks amy 
Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that discussion and thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoy the Content 10X podcast, then why not hit that subscribe button on your podcast listening app of choice so that you can get updated when new episodes are released. And I'd really, really appreciate it if you could leave a review as well. That really makes a difference for the podcast. Also, please do get a copy of my book, Content 10X, More Content, Less Time, Maximum Results. It is the ultimate guide to repurposing every type of content and it's available on Amazon in Kindle and paperback and also in audiobook as well and you can head to content10x.com forward slash book to find all the other places that you can get a copy of my book and if you would like us to do your content repurposing for you then we offer a fully end-to-end done for you content repurposing service this is for podcasters and video content creators we have our podcast 10x video 10x and also our specific LinkedIn 10x service helping you to become the leading authority in your industry on LinkedIn. You can find out so much more about our services on our website and also please do give me a follow on the social media platforms. I share lots and lots of tips and advice on social media about content repurposing. I'm at content 10x on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. And if you try content10x.com forward slash LinkedIn, you'll find my LinkedIn profile over there as well. All that's left to say is thank you so much for listening to this week's episode and I'll catch you in the next one.